Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Erlock, and this is another talk on logic, philosophy, and my favorite philosopher, Ludwig Wittgenstein. We are going to give a short talk here. I'm going to give a short talk. Uh, I don't know how much you can talk uh, with me here. I'm going to give you a short talk on Wittgenstein's life and a little bit about the passage of his early thought to his later thought, and then I will go on to make other videos detailing out other points about his later notebooks and later thinking. But to begin, as I've always enjoyed beginning some of my Wittgenstein uh, lectures when I am covering him briefly, in an end-of-the-century poll in the year 2000, in the year 2000... Profo uh, prophosophy philosophers, those people, philosophy professors from America and Canada were asked to list the five most important books that influenced their own work. So Americans and Canadians are not the only people that exist on, in the world for now. But as far as what's going on in the Anglophonic world in the Americas in philosophy, what Americans and Canadian philosophy professors are doing is important for all of that. And this is particularly the Anglophonic world and analytic philosophy around these parts, especially at major universities. And when the results were tallied up of this poll, the Philosophical Investigations was number one, and the Tractatus was number four. Now, the Philosophical Investigations is the central book of his later work, which turns against the earlier work, which is put centrally and foremost in the Tractatus. So in other words, Wittgenstein very much did not like his earlier thinking, contradicted it a great deal with his later work, and his newer second philosophy is number one, and his older philosophy is number four. So that's <laughs> a good indicator, I think. It's a good way of explaining how important Wittgenstein is to a lot of the Anglophonic world, as well as philosophy in general, I do think the Germans, oddly enough, don't pay Wittgenstein great mind, although I'm not sure in recent years how that's fared. Uh, the French have paid some mind to Wittgenstein, but they have their own French thinkers. The Anglophonic world very much imported, uh, well, Cambridge imported Wittgenstein from Austria. Uh, not directly. Uh, Wittgenstein sort of exported himself there and then showed up unannounced, pretty much. But stayed there and then moved around uh, from here to there and composed his earlier and his later work. And all of that is still incredibly important. In fact, people debate how much his earlier work or later work is more important. Pretty, I think the later work is more important, but at the same time, the earlier work then frames what comes later. So, and the development thereof. So... In 1911, Wittgenstein was supposed to study in Manchester after experimenting with weather monitoring kites and dreaming of creating a better propeller than the Wright brothers had a few years earlier in America. In fact, this is in the, uh, well, again, these are in the years around World War I. But after uh, Wittgenstein had visited Frege, he went to Cambridge to hear Bertrand Russell lecture on logic and mathematics, and he didn't register as a student there until the following year. So he originally wanted to do something like aeronautics and engineering, and he remained a very brilliant and talented individual with machines, much like Lewis Carroll, in fact, uh, with devices and mechanics. And he liked trying to invent uh, certain sorts of things. But I think Lewis Carroll actually ended up inventing, kind of toying with more devices, I think, than uh, Wittgenstein is famous for doing. But instead of that, uh, there is a theme in European philosophy anyway, where a lot of the Germans start off being theologians and then they get into being philosophers. The French and the English tend to start off as lawyers or scientists and then they tend to get into philosophy. And here you have a German guy who was trying to be something of a scientist engineer who then got fascinated with what are the rules of the rules, the rules of mathematics, logic, and thought. And so he got into philosophy, and specifically the philosophy of Bertrand Russell and Frege, as I've already been lecturing about for the logic lectures and for the modern European philosophy class and just in general. And he went there to try to boil down what are the logical chess moves of thought. How does the knight move? How does the rook move? And how does each piece of human thought move in what was hoped to be mathematical formations? Very algebra of the Islamic world and then formal logic of Boole, Frege, and, the, and Piano, and Russell. P 
piano was more uh, doing mathematics, I believe, but all of that uh, was important. So Wittgenstein read and adopted the idealist philosophy of Schopenhauer during his teenage years. We've had Schopenhauer already, uh, who called himself a Buddhist. And in fact, I do believe that Wittgenstein's ideas are Buddhist, uh, very Buddhist in interesting ways. But that's in spite of the fact that actually Schopenhauer does differently understands Buddhism and is not much about codependent arising, and Wittgenstein is. So I don't think that Wittgenstein is getting much direct Buddhism from Schopenhauer. But it's interesting that he happens to then line up in ways that are remarkably Buddhist that I don't think he gets from Schopenhauer. I'd be interested in any objections to that, but again, that's my best understanding. So... Wittgenstein very much was into Schopenhauer as a teenager, and then also read Nietzsche in his 20s and or 30s. I've been saying that, and I have to look that back up. Uh, but he had read some Nietzsche approvingly until he read and then followed up on the conceptual realism of Frege, and wants to know, okay, how does logic work? Now, throughout his life, Wittgenstein had a Schopenhauerian belief and was somewhat uh, kind of Kantian in a sense, which actually, in many ways, Wittgenstein, especially in his later works, wasn't Kantian at all. But in a certain sense, Wittgenstein very much held a Schopenhauerian kind of Buddhistic Kantian, again, that is odd, but see those lectures, belief that, a tr that true freedom can only be found in renouncing or overcoming or surpassing as, uh, the will as will, often through the experience of art for Schopenhauer. Again, uh, Schopenhauer seems to suggest that we reach clarity when we melt into and lo uh, art and lose ourselves, whereas Nietzsche seems to say that as individualists we should stand out and be meaningful as individuals through art and creativity. Uh, Schopenhauerian, but very opposite, in that we should be activists rather than pacifists about it. Wittgenstein bounced all over those ideas, but he ended up, and I do like Nietzsche, again, spirit of a house cat, I like Nietzsche's whole fighting spirit, but Wittgenstein very much was fascinated with what are the mechanical moves of the organism we are and tried to get into what, how logic figures things out with the nuts and bolts. And I do think that even though Nietzsche is a centrally inspiring thinker of European philosophy, Wittgenstein is still my favorite. I think I more have kind of overall the cynical outlook of Nietzsche compared to Wittgenstein. I think he was more a moral purist uh, and Nietzsche was just, ah, look at the whole smorgasbord of everything. Aside from personal behavior of myself, I assure you, or either of them, I think I would have got along a bit more personality-wise with Nietzsche. But Wittgenstein's thinking and what he, his personality and everything else about him drove him to are quite brilliant for looking at the nuts and bolts of human thought. More than any other thinker I've ever studied, although I am very happy to have studied a lot. And I've gotten a lot from many countless different names. Wittgenstein's ideas, I do think, should be pushed farther in particular. And that's what I was taught at Berkeley, that those who push Wittgenstein's ideas further will understand many fine things, and that's what I try to do with my students. I particularly enjoy sharing Nietzsche with students, and I also particularly enjoy sharing Wittgenstein. I find their ideas to be meaningful and powerful and inspiring. So Wittgenstein, as I mentioned his personality, was very eccentric and difficult with people. He often was very dogmatic, highly purist about his idealism and what he thought must be the case, and he was very intolerant, quite famously so, uh, and hard to work with. He was often convinced he was completely correct and the other person had to acknowledge that they were wrong and was very passionate about that. Again, Edgar Allan Poe says, that if you uh, go to a mathematician or a logician and you say math and logic aren't the center of the universe, take a step back, they may try to kill you or knock you down and out. So, ding, 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 you know, on all that with the emotions, pals. Uh, and with all of that, what with the subjectivity to the objectivity, etc., it's the real the duck rabbit Wittgenstein was fascinated with. He was very difficult himself. He was never fully comfortable at Cambridge and often got into disagreements with Russell, threatening to leave many times before fleeing to Norway, where he finished his Tractatus. He tried to get it published. There's an amazing photo of the cabin, which is in the middle of nowhere with a beautiful waterfall in Norway, where supposedly he finished his Tractatus, which is the basis of truth table logic and much of the exercises I have my logic students do, if you are logic students, hello. The truth table exercises that we do in formal logic in an intro class are based on the Tractatus, which is based on Frege and Russell's work and also Piano and many others. 
and Bool. But the Tractatus T's and F's come fr uh, turned into what is today, with a few slight changes, modern formal logic as it is taught to intro students. He tried to get this published, and no one would take it. Honestly, the work is not easy to understand. Experts argue over it. I think his later thinking is still hard to understand, but is so much clearer with simple thought experiments rather than the strange language of the Tractatus, which makes a lot of idealistic claims that may or may not be very true and make the whole work hard to understand. And then in the middle of the work, suddenly he says, by the way, here are truth tables. And so the Tractatus is a very strange book to, to try to get through. It is worth trying to get through. And I have gotten much through it and worked with it. However, I love his later thinking so much that I don't try to pick apart the Tractatus too carefully. That's always work yet more to be done. And it's just fascinating here that that is what defined formal logic for so many people soon after, but nobody would publish it at the time. It reminds, and I didn't mention the story, I often do, that the Wright brothers supposedly, I read, flew their glider in America uh, from and Europe from 1904 to 1907 and had telegraphed the army, and the army did not, the U.S. Army did not believe the Wright brothers had a working glider for three years. And, of course, the American Air Force somewhat took, uh, took off after the British Navy, and people worry about Americans, Chinese, and others in space, space, warfare, Star Wars, etc. And with all of that, it was Reagan, Trump, you know, onward, yeah. Um, with all of that and stuff, government spending, uh, you have essentially, um, <laughs> and where have I, let's get back to the talks here. It, uh, the Wright brothers actually tried to fly their glider and the army didn't believe them. It actually is very similar to uh, Wittgenstein is laying down the work of logic. Nobody believes it. Um, so Russell intervenes back in Cambridge. He wrote an introduction to it and had it published. And Wittgenstein read the introduction and he realized Russell had greatly misunderstood his work. Now, it's worth noting here that the reason, very simply put, that he thought that Russell misunderstood his work, and I actually don't have it right here in the notes because I go onward to then talk about it, the reason is because what Russell says in the intro, I have been mentioning along with lectures on logic and modern European philosophy, that many folks like Kant, but the problem with Kant and the problem with getting your objective truth from a Kantian base is technically Kant and Schopenhauer, the guy uh, who's a bit pricklier in personality, but uh, prickly Wittgenstein, I like that name, uh, as a teenager was definitely into Schopenhauer's uh, morose, interesting Buddhistic thinking, and which is still Kantian. Kant and Schopenhauer and other German idealists like that, they don't believe we can know anything about the world itself. The world in itself is unknowable. Kant even seems to think that morals are quite objective and rational. But he does have to admit, as soon as feeling gets involved with pure reason itself, now you have human interests, and then that kind of, even though there is pure-ish rational morality, and he, he has to kind of argue there can be, because for Kant, there's pure reason inside the skull and nothing else can be purely known at all. The problem is, is that Russell actually writes in the introduction, he says, well, this book is kind of hard to stand, understand, but this guy's a genius, you need to read this work because not only is this going to solve our problems, Russell saw in the middle of the truth tables and realized what a gift Wittgenstein had given to him and the world and for, uh, via formal logic, Russell believed. I, again, believe, like Wittgenstein did in his later period, that this sort of formal logic has very severe and potentially misleading implications to try to create the human computer program. And it has nothing to do with how you feel about it or hippie-ish or what. It has to do with we, we're just simply not a singular level computer program uh, as how we operate. So Wittgenstein, though, he reads, Russell says, not only is this going to solve logic, this is also going to help us start building the bedrock facts of science. Now, you'll notice, actually, from Newton to Einstein, people move from law to theory in the language about science. Science is technically, and I don't think you should distrust vaccines, has been walking away from the language of Newtonian law, and I think that Wittgenstein does walk us away from pure objective reason and law, but it gives us paradigms and practices. So you shouldn't distrust those, or you should as much as you judge you should distrust practices. Yes, and how can I make that call for you? But the thing is, is that Wittgenstein was always, in a certain sense, at least in this period, 
and one could say for the rest of his life, actually, in his later work, he was never the sort of thinker, even as a Kantian and Schopenhauerian, and he is being very Kantian in his work on Frege and Russell's logic for him with the truth tables and the Tractatus in Norway, where he didn't have to be around Russell or Frege or anybody else, in the cabin, by himself, trying to figure out how to talk to other people, by himself. Logic. A lot of these people are pretty prickly around the edges with people, by the way. That's good for thinking. So he realized that Russell wanted not only this to be the Kantian eyeglasses, yes, the shape of the Kantian eyeglasses that Kant was after, that Frege was after, that Boole was after very much, but again, like Boole and Frege, it's not enough to just have the lenses. There's talk that we're going to have the first facts of science firmly formed, and then we'll be able to base everything else on those first facts and first laws of science. Now, Wittgenstein never agreed and signed on to that plan. He remained a Schopenhauerian very much, such that he's a fan of the sciences discovering things. He apparently, in his later years, loved to walk around. Uh, he spent some time also in Ireland, away from anyone, uh, reading Wittgenstein. Uh, <laughs> reading Wittgenstein. Hopefully he read his own notes. He read Wonderland to two Welsh girls. He, he hung out in Wales. He then hung out in Ireland for a while. And he used to like to walk around the zoo, and he used to think that plants and rocks were amazing. So this is not a guy who dislikes uh, empiricism. He's not technically unempiricist, though, oddly enough. He could be called in his early work something like an idealist rationalist, and then, but then he gets to being an, an analytic thinker, and then he gets to being something more like a pragmatist, and he kind of regrets it in those words. Something like a, uh, well, mystical, almost pragmatist. That he realized Russell is going to try to build science for objective realsies out of his logic, and he never agreed to that because he was still very Kantian and did not believe that you can completely fix the facts of the world forever in objective text or knowledge. Because that's not what Kant argued, and he had a very Germanic view like that. So believing his Tractatus had solved all the problems of logic, He's like, okay, well, I'm done, and I don't like this guy in this intro, so I'm just going to avoid everybody again. He, uh, Wittgenstein left Russell and Cambridge again and went to be a schoolteacher in Austria. He got into child development and how children learn, which is incredibly important. I uh, really like child development and uh, how that fits with philosophy. I highly encourage looking at things from a historical and psychological angle. Hans Sluge likes using that language. He taught me uh, some of the finer Wittgenstein. And so Wittgenstein is, and always was, a very interesting... He grew up effectively uh, the child of one of the wealthiest families in Austria, but he decided to give away his portion of the family fortune anonymously to writers, but also his rich family, saying they wouldn't be corrupted by it. He left the, uh, the school he was teaching. Um, unfortunately, uh, it is reported that he did once or twice, actually, it was normal practice, unfortunately, to strike students for punishment. He actually, he actually struck a student, and she was hurt by that, which does not look good, of course, in hindsight. The students apparently did overall love him, but he was kind of, uh, the parents apparently did not like him. He was much more loved by the students than the parents, but this one time when he actually struck a student with a stick, which unfortunately, sadly, was normal practice at the time, and I don't endorse that, and that saddens me. The parents got together and forced him out of the school, um, and he was sad about all of that. He gave away portions of his family fortune to anonymously to writers, but also gave it, as mentioned, to his rich family, saying they won't be corrupted by it. He left the school, became a gardener's assistant. He was forced out. Became a gardener's assistant, uh, tried work with plumbing, and then his sister said, okay, I still have some money. Maybe he gave some of his to her. You can design me a house. And in fact, there is a famous house. There is a modern architect named Luce, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and that is not a good pronunciation, L-O-O-S. And he designed very modern, stark, brute architecture. Brute functionalism. And actually, Wittgenstein, there is a Wittgenstein house, which is the house Wittgenstein helped design, or designed primarily, Apparently, he sent specs to engineers for parts of the heating ducts, and they sent them back saying they were too specific, which is funny enough, if German engineers think you're way too uptight about numbers, yeah, yeah, it tells you something. Or Austrians, you know, all of them. And while he was finishing this house, which is apparently a modern, currently, uh, which you can see, somewhat a monstrosity in some people's opinions, um, in Wittgenstein's Vienna, which is a good book, uh, Tolman, I believe, 
he says in the beginning of that book, men, young men in the 70s today, like wearing their hair long eh, and dodging the draft. I haven't dodged the draft as far as I know about it. Maybe too successfully. I'm not sure. I didn't see it coming. That basically that they like doing all of that. But back in the day, he says, Wittgenstein's folks and the uptight older generation for these people love decorating everything with gaudy eagles and a bunch of gold and columns. And the younger generation was so sick of it that they wanted brute mod. They wanted t uh, short haircuts. They wanted simple functional things, very Bauhaus, very simple functionalism with the German modernism and wearing very simple clothes, simple haircuts. And so that's why Wittgenstein designed a very uptight, very square house, um, because he thought that was hip and cool compared to what Austrian decadent culture and all that was in Vienna at the time, which he thought was kind of... And if you look at the house Wittgenstein grew up in, which was a serious mansion, uh, takes up a block in the you know in Vienna, I think, or like a lot of it, it had a lot of very beautiful, gaudy rooms that full of a lot of decor. So he went the other way, you know, with all of that, with the money and the housing. So realizing, though, so while he was finishing this house, he was contacted by members of the Vienna Circle, who were positivists who hoped that Wittgenstein's Tractatus could give a solid foundation for science and logic the way that Russell's preface had framed it. And as he was talking to them, and as he was realizing he was actually switching to his mid and later thinking, and that he was having problems with his earlier thinking, he realized that they had misunderstood his work much like Russell, and he increasingly began to realize that there were problems with his thinking that even he had not seen that Russell misunderstood and that he had misunderstood. He began to realize that truth tables uh, have fundamental problems with them, and he got into intense arguments with the Vienna Circle members, at one point turning his back on his guests and reading Tagore, an Indian transcendental poet from India, out loud until they left. And I don't have an example right here, but I have read, if you pull, pull up a random poem by Tagore, it often says something like, the, uh, the sun, uh, the dawn breaks, a child cries and a dog barks. It is morning. And of course he's like, it's morning! You know, while he's yelling to get the lo more logical, analytic-minded uh, Vienna Circle away from him, which I like. Uh, and I have to say, it, I, what I think that Wittgenstein was struggling for the rest of his life through uh, against the logical positivists that he was very much a logical god for, that they misunderstood his Tractatus and that actually his thinking that tried to boil everything down to moves of logic had mistaken human thinking, which actually was increasingly, he understood, more psychological and practical. Which, what I think the best way that I teach people that is... Instead of boiling down, and this fits with so many wonderful Wittgensteinian metaphors and thought experiments, instead of boiling everything down to one basement element, you look at it as a tangle of several simple identifiable things, things a child could find that they could see adults pursue or not, or talk about with simple words or not. And if you look for that interconnection, I often now like saying there's at least sensory things that we see and imagine. We then have, and, and all the rest of our senses, we then have emotions as children i was just hanging out with friends and their little daughter and she was certainly does not know any words yet i apologized for cursing once or twice and they're like ah it's cool because she doesn't really know how to pick up any words yet but she's hearing them which means the child has sensory and emotive experience under you know can feel emotions in others as much as that is or isn't a thing for us feeling for others but then increasingly all that comes into practices like adults, not necessarily clarity, with the coming and the learning of how to speak oneself and the learning of words. How to talk things out to oneself and uh, silently in the head and others publicly out loud, which Vygotsky says happens all at the same time. First the child says the horse goes in the barn out loud like a narrator to themselves and slowly learns to silently talk to themselves as much of, but not all of, thinking. Because Vygotsky himself says we substitute imagination and image for words, and that makes it go faster. Here Wittgenstein says, think of the sound of a clarinet. You wouldn't spend time, waste time representing it any other way. And that's how we, uh, with sensation, even imaginary, remembered or imagined sensations, emotions and motives, and also words. The problem is, is that what I think Wittgenstein was getting to, that I, the way I like to explain it today, and my thinking has even been clarifying in the last couple of weeks, is that he had been trying to boil everything down into one element with logic, but even that failed, because in a certain sense you would have to feel how the symbols work. You couldn't just talk it or symbolize it entirely out. It would be turtles all the way down like the previous talk. It would be an infinite regress to fully represent anything in words 
or emotions or sensible syllables or uh, symbols, syllables, anything. So in 1929, he decided to return to Cambridge to correct his thinking and teach. He's going to move to his middle and later thinking as he continues to teach uh, from 29 until 50 and 51 when he then died, unfortunately, of cancer. Um, and uh, as he was trying to work out his later notebooks, his last notebooks. Uncertainty is particularly a good one. Um, if you have to buy any Wittgenstein or know any Wittgenstein, the philosophical investigations and uncertainty are his middle and last thinking. As if you just bought two books of Wittgenstein, it would be the philosophical investigations and uncertainty, which again, the last part of philosophical investigations and uncertainty contains the more psychological, pragmatic ideas he was wrestling with as he died, which very much, I would say, suggests that thought should be studied as a psychological historical phenomenon, not a formally logical phenomenon. So he decided to return to Cambridge to correct his thinking, and to his horror, I absolutely love his social awkward self in this imaginary situation, and think of how we were represented with multiple elements, emotions, words, sights, and sounds. To his horror, when he arrived at the train station, uh, Cambridge, or near it, he was greeted by a vast crowd of intellectuals, like, wow, it's crowded today. Oh, no, um, they're all here to see me get off the train. And he didn't realize that as a very socially awkward, uptight individual because he was the author of the Tractatus. And so he was logic. Uh, he was, well, the famous uh, economist John Maynard Keynes wrote to his wife, well, God has arrived. I met him on the 515 train. So he shows up and all these people in Cambridge, they think that he's invented Tractatus, truth table logic, and he's amazing. And Wittgenstein just continued uh, to lecture at Cambridge, develop his ideas. He, as he firmly, though, already at that station, believed that he had screwed up and what they were all there to celebrate. He is logic god. He's like, and I was wrong. <laughs> like, none of that's actually all that useful. And we should look for more fruitful, useful representations of thought than simply formal logic. I, again, think that many of his metaphors suggest that instead of reducing things to one thing, you look at it as simple intertwining of different elements, faculties of mind, uh, practices that don't, cannot rely on one element and certainly cannot rely on one element being absolutely there all the time with complete certainty. That is not human life or thought. So Wittgenstein continued to lecture. In 1934, he traveled to Soviet Russia. He actually considered defecting, we know, saying he wanted to be a plumber. There's an excellent, uh, if you like any of this stuff, I highly recommend the, tr the purposely awful biographical movie, Wittgenstein, which is uh, shot, I think, honestly, as a bad state uh, high school play on purpose because it's bad acting and it's like sort of being out of context and not being like really situational and contextual properly, which is modern art with Wittgenstein very much. And I do love that movie, but then again, that whole movie is hackneyed Wittgenstein philosophy that's like put on almost, by good actors, but it's almost like staged by high school students. So it's like purposefully bad Wittgenstein, which I love, but then again, I like Wittgenstein and I already know what he's doing. So that might be harder for some people to watch. I'll just warn you. But there's a great scene in that movie I always have to mention whenever I lecture about this is that he goes to Soviet Russia and there's uh, the Soviet commissars there and she's like, uh, or Wittgenstein. Welcome to the People's uh, Republic, you know, of the Soviet Union. And we have, if you wish to join us here, we have excellent opportunities for teaching at Moscow or the other universities, two or three she, lifts off, uh, she lists off quickly in Russia. You could be the head of the logic department anywhere you, you dang please here and let us offer the primary positions. I don't know if this ever happened at all like this. And then Wittgenstein says, you know, I've always wanted to be a plumber and work with my hands. And she says, <laughs> Professor Wittgenstein, you know, the one thing we have plenty enough of here in the Soviet Union is unskilled labor. You happen to have basically invented modern logic or helped do that. You know, the one thing we're not going to put you to, I don't know if you know how uh, hard socialism, you know, sort of works or tries to for the people. But the last thing we're going to do socially planning out the labor of the Soviet Union in the name of the people is use you as a plumber, pal. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so he didn't defect to the Soviet Union. He went back to Cambridge and he didn't return. Uh, it has been said, and in, there is a scene in the movie where he looks into the camera and does, after hearing of Stalin says it's an ordered society, which I think is implying that he unfortunately did idealize Russia and uh, a bit. 
And then when Stalin's crimes did come out, some intellectuals had to either backtrack or be kind of silent about what they had been supporting that now is turning a bit deadly, not knowing how the experiment of communism in Russia would turn out or not. And when Stalin, uh, of course, Stalin's... uh, Practices very much turn many people into either, well, not that or never communism much, uh, or, of course, in America, no socialism in the slightest, uh, in theory. But again, that's different from actual interwoven practices that are always complex and varied more than just idealism or, you know, propagandistic points. Um, But yeah, um, (laughs) Wittgenstein uh, somewhat remains silent about the, uh, what was, let's call it problematic in Soviet Russia. And so, yeah, that is a thing somewhat on him, but that is, I think, people being honest about his life, and his life was sort of an amazing one that was good and bad and all over the place. So, the, uh, in a one passage, and to mention, um, well, to give a final uh, give a final mention here of his life, because we've already gotten here a half hour talk in the book Wittgenstein's Poker, which I also recommend. It doesn't have much to do, I have to say. I found with Wittgenstein's philosophy, it's a more biographical book. You can tack on to lots of understanding about Wittgenstein, and it's a good book for that. There's an interesting account of Popper's infamous argument with Wittgenstein in 1946, so four years before uh, Wittgenstein was uh, unfortunately um, in, in his deathbed. At Cambridge, Karl Popper gave a visiting lecture about the nature of philosophical problems to the Moral Science Club, of which Wittgenstein was the president. Now, hilariously enough, again, Wittgenstein and the outlook, as I described it, would not believe really in moral science. So it's kind of hilarious that he is the president, because actually what their disagreement is about is there is no such thing as absolute morality. So Popper, Russell, and White, and Wittgenstein, I almost said White, began heatedly arguing about the nature of truth, And Wittgenstein pacing the aisles in frustration because Popper is somebody who believes that science, like Russell, can come up with absolute facts that are objective. Wittgenstein did not believe so. And Popper also thinks then we can come up with morality that is good in society. And Wittgenstein does not think so. He's more the stormy Schopenhauerian. And so as he was pacing the aisles around, he uh, it's a fancy building with a fireplace in, the, in many of the rooms. So he grabs a poker from the fireplace and he begins to gesture with it wildly as he speaks, just unconsciously to emphasize his points. And Russell asked Wittgenstein to put the poker down at least once or twice, but he refused. And the... Uh, that essentially he was asked by uh, Popper... That Popper basically, uh, he said, give me, he says to Popper, um, give me a single example of a moral principle uh, that's absolute in all situations, which would be universal Kantian morality. And uh, Popper says that you should not threaten visiting lectures with pokers, which drew a laugh from the crowd a bit, and Wittgenstein hurled the poker down and left. Now, the funny thing is, is Popper actually partly falsified his memories uh, because the way he remembers it, he actually favors himself the way that humans psychologically do. Funny enough, Popper is a big fan of trying to keep uh, objectivity in the language of the sciences rather than have some kind of relativism. But oddly enough, uh, Popper somewhat made himself look more favorable in his telling of the version, which I did not tell. But basically, Wittgenstein threw the poker down and left because, of course, Popper had made a joke. He did not actually give an example of an absolute rule. He gave a jokey answer that was true in the immediate moment. It actually does resemble the Mad Hatter Tea Party a bit for Alice. And Wittgenstein throws down the poker and says, that's not a moral, you're just fooling with me. And he leaves and he storms out of the Moral Science Club demanding he give one moral and he can't because he gave a joke instead. So that unfortunately uh, is... Then, um, yes, Wittgenstein spent his latter years writing in his notebooks, and he was, interestingly enough, he did not have access to word processing. I do. I have 90 pages of Wittgenstein quotes I've paraphrased for myself, and I mix and match them, and I can search those. I can think, oh, what's that one about smiling, and search and find that there's four times he mentioned smiling in the 90 pages of Wittgenstein I put together. He was actually cutting up uh, portions of his notebooks, rewriting them, moving the, the uh, trying to switch all the paragraphs around. He was sending it to secretaries. They were type uh, writing it out and then sending it back and probably screwing things up and everything was lost. 
It really is sad because uh, much like Edgar Allan Poe wanted to create cheaper newspaper and failed in the venture, but would have loved YouTube, Wittgenstein would have loved actually uh, word processing, basic like Word or Google Docs or something, because that's what he was actually trying to do in frustration to get his notebooks and what his whole meaning and what he was trying to say in his notebooks clearer to himself in his own words and reword it for himself. And that is what I am going to go on and do for you. Unfortunately, again, World War II happened. Uh, Wittgenstein famously, there was somebody walking with him and says, I think the British will win the war against the Germans World War II because they have a better national character. And Wittgenstein said, I don't know how anybody this stupid could do philosophy. Uh, what are you talking about, national character? But again, Storm and Sh Stormy Schopenhauerian, history of a village is a history of an empire. Oh, the huge manatee. All, all the way down with the turtles. So with all of that, Wittgenstein did die a bit after World War II as a conflicted Jewish intellectual who was always wondering how much his Jewishness affected his own thinking, quite sadly, in an age of deep prejudice against Jewish people, which we have not entirely left, in which he was possibly fighting. There's other angles here where it is very possible Wittgenstein was fighting homosexual urges and feelings and having occasional love affairs or not, and that is all the matter of great speculation. Um, in the movie Wittgenstein, they run with, they actually make it a gay movie, somewhat camp classic. Oddly enough, it's an intellectual biography, a bad high school play, and a queer theory, a cinema, as queer, not my words, classic, um, for, where they just run with, where Wittgenstein is surrounded by like sexy male grad students or kind of like, you want a back rub? And it's like, I don't think he ever had it that way, you know. But interestingly enough, he is also somewhat closeted and gay, I do believe. He may have been a bit bisexual, but it actually does appear that he was possibly, well, again, possibly, again, predominantly homosexual and then did not know how to feel about all of that. He saw World War II crush much of all kinds of Europe and then saw the uh, heard of the nuking of Japan. Of course, saw all of you know, the print about that. And he was unfortunately passing at a time where he really did wonder about if you fight the fight between formal logic and pragmatic uh, psychological thinking, will this solve any of the world's issues, you know, as Schopenhauer himself doubted. So with all of that, that is the interesting prickly life of Wittgenstein. He, uh, and he said, I believe his final words were something to the effect of, tell them I've lived a good life. That overall I've lived a stormy existence, but it has been good overall, you know, and certainly throughout it worth it. And in fact, um, I did not mention in the beginning, as I often do with such emphasis, Wittgenstein's uh, had a large family, but many of his brothers uh, committed suicide. Very sadly, it ran in his family. It was romantic in Austria at the time, unfortunately, a bit culturally romantic uh, suicide. And Wittgenstein himself considered it very much, especially uh, between his earlier and later thinking. And it is very good that he did not, because otherwise, again, well, he was taken too early anyway. And he was taken as he was working out some of his later thinking. And I do believe that his later thinking is potentially Copernican, as I have told people, because it better represents how thinking works and meaning more than anything before it. So I will get into why that is and how that is in the next couple of talks. So thank you for paying attention to that. Hopefully you got a bit of a bang out of that. And if you want to, please watch the movie Wittgenstein, which I own and have subjected many people to. And if you like philosophy enough, you will not hate it completely. So it's a weird movie, though. It doesn't really have too much sex or violence in it. It is mostly just strange philosophy shot out of a fire hose at you. So be prepared for that. And also weird alien beings in a uh, moment or two with terrible effect. So much love, much happiness. And as usual, I will see you if I ever do see you.